Well, good morning, guys. How are we doing? Let me get situated here. So, um, listen, I'm excited. This, this week we're starting off, kind of kicking a new series off, um, talking about expecting greater things and expecting the Holy Spirit. Um, and last, for the last two weeks, Casey started us off in 2019, talking about this new Vision 2020 that we have. And, and kind of what is God doing in South Florida through Church United, which is this collection of churches coming together, and it seems like God is working in that and is bringing lost people to him. And so what we want to do is we just want to join, like Casey said, we want to join in what God is doing here at the Avenue Church in all of South Florida. And so some goals that we have for that is we want to see lost people come to Christ. We want to see new believers baptized and brought in to Jesus' church. And one of the ways that we said we can do that, that we need to do that, is through establishing like a, a culture of expectation. A culture of expectation. And so what does that mean? Like that, that sounds, it sounds really nice. It sounds pretty churchy. Um, but like what, is, what does it mean to be a culture of expectation, to expect the Holy Spirit in our lives and in the church? And so that's what we're going to do um, this morning. We're just kind of un- going to unpack generally what it means to expect the Holy Spirit. And for the next two weeks, um, Casey's going to jump in a little bit deeper. But here's the plan for today. We're going to look at a passage of Scripture. And th- this part of Scripture happens like before Jesus' death and resurrection. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at this passage of Scripture that's a really good example, I think, of, of what it means to, to like, kind of have this culture of expectation to expect the Holy Spirit. And then we're going to take that passage, like I said, it's before the death and resurrection, and we're going to say, okay, well, after the resurrection, like, how do we interpret that? What's the same? What's different? Like, what do we do with that in 2019? And then after we kind of understand that, we're going to say, well, well, what does that mean specifically for the Avenue Church, for Vision 2020, and for us in this room? Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Unpack, there we go. All right, cool. Good, good start, good start. Um, so the passage that we're going to read is Matthew, comes from Matthew 14, verses 22 to 32. And Jesus is with his disciples, okay, and, and he's, he's doing ministry, he's performing miracles, he's preaching, and he's getting really famous. Like, word about this, this Jesus is spreading, okay? And just before this passage, he just fed 5,000 people in this amazing miracle, And so we pick up in verse 22, and this is what it says. Immediately, he made the disciples get into a boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Which, side note, is something that Jesus did a lot, and I think we can learn from that. He went up on the mountain by himself to pray. And when evening came, he was there alone. But by this time, the boat was a long way off from the land, beaten by the waves, and the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, like in the middle of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It's a ghost, and they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid." And Peter answered him, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. And Jesus said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink. And he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. So let's pray this morning, and we're going to jump in. Jesus, thank you that you call us to new things. God, you don't just call us to things and then abandon us, Lord, but you meet us in those times. And so, Lord, we ask this morning, Lord, we we lean on your promise that when we gather together as Christians, that you're with us in a special way. So, Lord, we we ask that you would do that. We we expect that you would do that. We ask that you would would bring 
people to life this morning, maybe who have never understood the gospel, who have never experienced your love, that today would be the day that they would come to you and receive life. Lord, for those of us that, that know you, God, we, we just ask that you would remind us of the gospel this morning. Lord, because there's nothing better than the gospel. There's no idea or, or phrase that's better than the gospel. Would you just remind us who you are because that's what we need every week. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So this, this passage of Peter getting out of the boat um, has kind of been coming up over and over and over in my life recently, I feel like. It's not like, it's not one of my favorite passages that I always go to and that I love to teach. Like, I, I didn't really pay a ton of attention to it um, until the last couple months. I feel like it's come up over and over. Actually, two weeks ago, in our Friday youth gathering that we've sort of started, I, I, I preached through this. And so we got our youth over here and the leaders, and they're like probably super sick of hearing about Peter get out of the boat. So sorry, guys. Um, but we've been meeting on Fridays. It's been really awesome. Um, there's been some, some cool fruit that's come from that. Um, we've got to preach the gospel to s- some people who, who have never heard it, which is pretty amazing. And also, we've, we've played glow-in-the-dark football, so it's like kind of a win-win on Friday nights. Um, but this passage keeps, keeps coming up, I feel like, recently for me. You know that um, you know, the first time that I got to preach was a couple months ago, and and so I'm, I'm like getting ready to preach and I, I get here early that morning and I'm super nervous and scared and I'm full of fear and anxiety and like, why are you doing this, Sam? Like, why did you sign up to do this? This is your fault. <laughs> and so I, I get here and it's early. I'm, I'm like trying to remind myself, like, look, it's not about you. You just need to remember the gospel. Like, and so I'm here and the band is playing through their set a little bit early and I'm trying to remind myself of the gospel and not, not kind of sit in my fear and my anxiety. Um, and Mitch comes up to me, and he goes, hey, Sam, can I pray with you? And I was like, no, nah, get out of here. You're the worst. No. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, yes, please, please, please pray with me. And so he, he prayed this passage over me, um, and he just said, Lord, I, I asked that Sam would keep his eyes on you, that he wouldn't look to the chaos, he wouldn't look to the left or to the right, but that he would keep his eyes on you in this moment and that you would sustain him. Um, and so that, that, that kind of just stuck with me throughout the morning, and first song starts, and I, I'm like, again, welling up with fear and anxiety, like, why am I about to do this? And, and I'm, I, I keep looking around, I'm like, oh no, people are here. Like, <laughs> that's the worst. Uh, I didn't expect that. This feels like more people than are normally here. Is this more? Like, who's, who's sitting where? And, and I'm like, starting to focus on everything that I shouldn't be focusing on during that first song. And then that, what Mitch prayed over me, it just kind of came back to me. And I said, okay, Lord, I'm, I'm, not, gonna, I'm not gonna turn my head. Like, everything in me wants to turn, and, and who's here? How many people are here? What are they going to think? Where? And I said, Lord, I'm just going to, I'm going to focus forward. I'm going to worship. Lord, and I'm going to ask that you would meet me in this moment because I'm scared out of my mind. <laughs> and, and I feel like God was gracious in that moment, and I can tell you that, that those last two or three songs of worship um, during that moment were, were some of, if not the most, like, awesome and, and present worship that I feel like I've had in, in a really, really long time. And I feel like the Holy Spirit blessed me in that way because like, there was this, this, this fear and this great anxiety and, I, and God, just, God was good in that moment. So as we kind of unpack um, this idea of expectation, expecting the Holy Spirit, I, I think it's important that we remember this is like, this isn't some big you know, idea or, or theology. Like this is, this is super practical stuff. Like this, this happens often in our lives. Um, and so in Matthew 14, we see Peter, or Jesus walks out to the disciples who are on the boat in a storm, like the wind and the waves are, are coming and they're terrified. They're terrified that, yeah, there's this person in the middle of the night walking towards the boat. Probably pretty scary. Um, and, and so, you know, this, this conversation takes place, and, and Peter actually steps out of the boat. And as long as he keeps his eyes on the one who's calling him, as long as he, he keeps his focus on Christ, then Jesus is sustaining him. And he, start, he does what we all do, and he takes his eyes off of Jesus, and he starts to forget what's he, what he knows to be true. And he starts to sink when he looks at his surroundings and takes his eyes off of Christ. But even in that moment, like, Jesus is says that he's immediately there for him, right? And then they get back on the boat and they worship Jesus. And so there's, there's kind of three observations that I want to make about this passage before we kind of jump 
to our next sections like we said we're going to do. The first is this. Peter already knew the one calling him. And I, and I think that's important because Peter's confidence came from who he knew Jesus was before this event. Like there was a pre-existing relationship that had kind of built this trust, which, which led Peter to actually step out and say, I can expect that when I step out, Jesus is going to sustain me. His confidence was 100% in the person doing the calling, not in the action of what he was stepping out. He wasn't like, man, I think if I place my feet like just this right way and, and like wiggle my toes, maybe I can like, I think I might be able to do it. I might be able to walk on water. And plus Jesus is out there. So like the two of us working together, maybe we can do this thing. No, it was 100% confidence in the one who was calling, not in his own ability. And he said, Lord, since it's you, since I know your character, what you say about me and who you are, I'm willing to, to step out with the expectation that you're going to meet me there, that you're going to sustain me. Second observation, Peter gets out of the boat imperfectly. He gets out of the boat imperfectly. So like, put yourself there. Imagine that you're on this boat in the middle of this body of water. The wind and the waves are going crazy. It's the middle of the night. Like, I don't know if you guys have ever been in a boat in, in like rough water, but there's not a lot more unsettling than that. I remember when I was in high school, we took this trip down to the Keys and I was with my brother and we had this kind of old weird pontoon boat. Um, it, it was me, my brother, and his friend. And so we go out, we're fishing in the Keys, and there's this island like way, way, way far away, farther than a pontoon boat should travel in the ocean. <laughs> and so we're like, hey, we're going to go fish at that island because that's where all the fish are because we know where fish are because we're 17. And so like we, 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 we get like super far out, and all of a sudden this, there's like this bad weather starts to come in. Um, and my brother's we start to have this conversation like, okay, what do we do? Like, seems like it's kind of small, like maybe it's just a little storm. And I'm like, no, guys, we need to go back. Like, this is, this is not going to end well for us on this little weird boat. And my brother's friend goes, no, dude, I'll tell you what we got to do is we just got to gun it straight at the storm, and then we'll punch through on the other side. It'll be perfect, and we'll go fishing. <laughs> and I'm like, dude, what, like, you like Jack Sparrow? Like, you want to die on this boat today? Like, what's wrong with you? We just got here yesterday. Like, we're not, this is not who we are. I'm like, we got to go back. And so, so we start to go back. Um, but even as we go back, we're like, we're like riding and like psh, hitting the water. And it's like, dude, we're just in this little tiny thing in the middle of this huge ocean that can do it whatever it wants with us. And so to get out of the boat, like the fact that Peter got out of the boat in that setting is insane. And it seems to us like, man, that's this awesome, awesome, like, faith that he has to step out and do this thing. But he, he does it, but he does it imperfectly, right? Because as soon as he's out, he then begins to, to doubt and to look around and to look at the chaos and to take his eyes off of Christ. See, in, the, in that moment, that's, that's kind of what Peter does. That's kind of his MO, like, through Scripture, is he's, which I can relate to. He, he's like, yeah, Jesus, I'm all in. I love you. I'll step out of the boat for you. And then he's like, oh, shoot, I'm going to die. And then he's like, Jesus, I, I trust you. No, I don't trust you. Jesus, I'll die for you. Uh, who's Jesus? No, I don't know that guy. Like, that's, that's kind of the up and down kind of person that Peter was. And so he didn't know exactly what was going to happen when he stepped out of the boat, but he did it anyways. But it didn't, he, didn't, he, he didn't act perfectly through the whole story. He was imperfect. He had his moments but it wasn't him. Number three, Jesus meets and sustains Peter on the water. And this is, this is the whole point of the passage, that Jesus meets and sustains Peter on the water. Even as his eyes drifted, even as he took his eyes off of Christ, Jesus was the one who, especially in that moment, especially when he forgot who Jesus was, he met him and he sustained him. And I think that tells us something about Jesus. As we begin to talk about Vision 2020 and this culture of expectations and what it's like to step out into something and expect that you're going to be met, we've got to know the one who's calling us, that he's going to meet you, that he's going to sustain you because that's his character. Because the story is not about Peter and his faith. It's about Christ and his sustaining and rescuing of Peter. So as we kind of take that first jump, like that's, 
That's what happened in the story. Now, what about us in 2019, like after the death and, death and resurrection? Because Jesus was with the disciples. The Spirit was with the disciples in like a different way than it is with us now. Jesus was physically with them, and he, he walked with them, talked with them, called, he called Peter physically to step out of the boat. But that's, that's not the setting, the surrounding that we find ourselves in. We See, we have the Spirit inside of us in a way that the disciples didn't, right? And that's only because of the death and resurrection of Christ. That's the pinnacle point in Scripture. That's the pinnacle point in human history that changes everything. So it's going to change the way we, we hear a call from God and the way that we step out of a boat because through the gospel, like, we all have the Spirit inside of us. And so as we kind of talk about who the Holy Spirit is, the Holy Spirit is God. He, he's eternal. He is God. And he, he is involved in creation. He's involved in the Old Testament. We see, that we see the Holy Spirit, like, applied to specific people in specific times to do specific things in the Old Testament. But there was no general giving of the Spirit to God's people in the Old Testament. We see him given to King Saul, given to David. And then along comes Jesus, and he has these promises, and he talks about, hey, there is a helper coming. Who's, it's going to be better for you to have this helper, to have this advocate, than even to have me here physically with you. And that's the Holy Spirit, because Jesus... Jesus changed everything. There was this man-made separation between God and man. There's no way for individuals to know God intimately because of this separation. No universal giving of the Spirit, but Jesus changes that. Jesus, God in human form, he was perfect. He wasn't flawed like you and me. He, wasn't, he didn't make any mistakes. He didn't sin. And towards the end of his time, like we said, he promises this new covenant, this new agreement between God and man that hasn't been in place yet, but is coming. But the problem is that that new agreement that Jesus promised, that is the Holy Spirit like inside of us connecting us to the Father, that didn't come for free. That came at a price. See, the price for our sin, the price for our disobedience to God was death. And Jesus took that death when he went to the cross. He, he assumed my, my debt and your debt on the cross, and he paid for it, but he didn't stay dead. Three days later, he rose again, showing that he's, he's even more powerful than death. No human being can, can die and come back to life. But because of who Jesus is, he can prove that he's God by coming back to life. And once he does that, he ushers in this new agreement between man and God. This kind of new set of rules that, that we actually receive life in the Spirit now. That, it, that all believers, when you put your faith and trust in Christ, you are given the Holy Spirit. That you, can, that you can walk and talk with God and know Him intimately right now. The Spirit's no longer given to like this person to do this job, but it's given to all of us at salvation. All believers have the Spirit. But when we look in the New Testament, we see sometimes like the Apostle Paul will write these letters and he'll pray that this church, this group of believers would be filled with the Spirit. And we just said that, that like all believers have the Spirit at salvation, but he would pray on top of that, like I pray that they would be filled to the brim with the Spirit. There's this general Spirit, but then he's praying on top of that in addition to that they would be filled with the Spirit. And I was reading in this commentary and I thought, that's smarter than me, so I'll just read it to them. It says this about being filled with the Spirit. The filling of the Holy Spirit is not a one-time event that we live off of for the rest of our days. It is a constant filling, an asking to be filled, and a receiving of the filling by faith. I'll read it one more time. The filling of the Spirit is not a one-time event that we live off of for the rest of our days. It's a constant filling, and asking to be filled, and a receiving of that filling by faith. So we don't, we, don't, we don't buy a car and put gas in it and then drive it forever. We continually stop and, and put new fuel in it. As we talk about this culture of expectation, the only fuel that, that the church has is the Holy Spirit. The fuel that you have in your personal life only comes from being filled 
with the Spirit, because on your own, you have no power to change. You have no power to fight sin. You have no power to know God. It only comes from the Spirit. And so that's our context now. Um, we all have the Spirit, but we can, in some way, be filled with it. And I, I need to constantly be filled, because like Peter, I am so quick to forget who Jesus is. I'm so quick to forget. I need that reminding constantly, that, that refilling up of the Spirit. And so, so, like, as Peter got out of the boat over here, like, remember, no, no Spirit's given generally in this context. He gets out of the boat, and he, he walks to Jesus' physical body, and he keeps his eyes on Jesus' physical body. And that's, that's, that's the agreement over here. But once we get over here, where we are, where now we have the Spirit, see, we're not called physically by Jesus to do, like, these specific tasks. And so what does it mean for us to keep our eyes on Christ in the same way that Peter kept his eyes on Jesus in the sea? And I think it's fair to say that as we, as we receive and are filled with the Spirit, that's how we keep our eyes focused on Christ. That's where we get our true north, by, by being filled with the Spirit. Okay, and that's the only thing, as we talk about ushering in a culture of expectation, it's not going to happen by you and me. It's going to happen by the Holy Spirit. And so, so okay, that's our, that's our new covenant now through the gospel because of what Jesus did. So what about the Avenue Church? Like, what about this vision 2020? If we want to see lost people come to Christ, if we want to see new believers baptized and new believers join the church. Like, that, that's not going to happen from up here, from me speaking, from Casey speaking, from, me, like, maybe a little bit, some, but, but like, this, evan- this, like, evangelical movement that this Vision 2020 is, it's going to happen through the, through the body of Christ, through individual believers being filled with the Spirit, and then stepping out of the boat in your, in your world, where you work, in your family, in your context. It doesn't happen from the stage. It happens when, when, the, when the body of believers are filled with the Spirit and going out into their context. It happens largely outside of Sunday morning. That's why it's a culture and not a sermon series. So those, those ingredients, I think, that, that come, to, come to that culture of expectation are, number one, to be filled with the Spirit. To be, to be the kind of people who, who desire what the Spirit desires, who quickly come to Jesus and say, Jesus, I, I need you, God. Would you fill me? I need you. That desire to be filled with the Spirit, number one. And then number two, being willing to step out of the boat to what Jesus has called us to. Being willing to take a risk and to put something on the line and to say, because the person who's calling me, I'm going to step out. But this culture of expectation, I, I think there are there are some side effects, so I, I think they'll come up here on the screen. Some side effects to a culture of expectation are fear and doubt, risk, realization of your own inability, fear of the unknown, fear of, fear of rejection. Like, what's going to happen if I, if I take this step from maybe what's comfortable into something new? Like, if, if this vision is, is centered around evangelism, what happens when I, like, start to have conversations that I don't normally have. Like, I, I don't know what to say. I don't, I'm not smart enough. Or, or like, man, is, is God really even calling me this? See, everything in our flesh, everything in our flesh will take you right to these things. Right to these things. Risk. Like, what if this goes badly? What, what could I lose? Like, if I'm willing to put extra time, extra money on the line, or if, I, if I'm willing to step out into these uncomfortable situations, like, what will people think of me? You're putting something on the line. My favorite is the realization of inability. Realization of your own inability. Because this, this vision, this, this culture, is centered around spiritual things. To see people who don't know Jesus come to know Jesus. To see people get baptized. To see people join the church. Fall in love with Jesus. You can't do that. And I can't do that. I, I can't save people. I can't make people get baptized. Peter can't walk on water. But he still steps out of the boat into something that he, he feels like he, he can't do. Guess what? Because he can't. 
But the one who's calling him, who's going to sustain him, is the one who is able. And so if those are some of the side effects, here are a couple things that I think a culture of expectation produce. Number one, it increases an increased dependence on the Holy Spirit. When you live in the place that you're begging to be filled with the Spirit because you're stepping out into tasks that you have no ability to do on your own, like that's a healthy, gospel-centered, Jesus-honoring place to live. That you are dependent. God, I need you to show up in this moment because I'm, I'm stepping out, and if I'm stepping to what you're calling me to, I need you to come through. I'm expecting you to come through. Number two, a renewed prayer life. When you're, put, when you're putting something on the line, those prayers get a little more real. Like the prayer before you're about to step into a conversation with somebody that you're not, that you're not totally comfortable with, that, that's an honest prayer. That gets real really quick. We learn to live in this renewed sense of, of prayer, this renewed sense of need. And number three, new gospel stories. See, Peter, Peter had a pretty sweet story the next day after that whole scene on the boat took place. And it wasn't a story about how he miraculously learned to walk on water. He had this gospel story of like, let me tell you what happened. I was scared out of my mind. I took this step into the ocean and Jesus met me and he sustained me. Let me tell you about who Jesus is. That's a gospel story. And I think as we do the same thing in our context, in our context we, we sense the calling of the Holy Spirit and we step out into that, even if it's uncomfortable, even if it's new, Gospel stories come from a culture like that. But risk is involved. Risk is involved in this culture of expectation. It's not always the most comfortable thing. Risks that maybe don't make sense to people around you. Like our lives as believers, as people who are filled with the Holy Spirit, should not always make sense to people who aren't. Like, if your life totally makes sense and the decisions you make and the way you spend your money and the way you spend your time totally makes sense to somebody who's not a believer, then maybe, maybe we need to reassess the way that we're living. Beyond, like, oh, they could, they could maybe sleep in on Sunday morning. I don't know why they go there. But everything else, like, that, that seems pretty normal. I think a culture of people who are expecting Jesus and who are constantly stepping out into faith, expecting and needing Jesus to come through, they're going to make some crazy decisions that people who don't know the person calling are going to be like, what are you doing? Like somebody on the boat who doesn't know Jesus, Peter, what are you doing? That makes no sense to me. But for those disciples who know Jesus, it's like, oh, yeah, this might work. And so as, pe as, as people like who aren't a part of this vision, who don't know Jesus, who don't know the one who's calling us to go out into the world and make disciples, look at us there should be a certain element of like, I don't know why you're doing that stuff. <laughs> because if they can look at your life and it makes pretty much perfect sense to them, something might be off in our motives for living. Because it's, it's in those times, it's in those times when, when it feels risky and it's something different and it's something uncomfortable where God meets us and he sustains us. That's what he did with Peter. Peter. So like I said, this, this vision on a large scale, and we talk about Church United and so many hundreds and thousands of Christians, and we want to, like, big picture view. That doesn't happen unless the church is filled with people who are being filled with the Spirit and who are consistently getting out of the boat when it's scary, when it's new, when it's uncomfortable. So just in closing, as the band kind of comes up and starts to play, um, there's a few questions that I want to ask a few things. Where, where has God, where is the Holy Spirit calling you? Who, who, in the, who is the Holy Spirit calling you to? Like that, that person that comes to your mind right now, that ministry that you've, you've like maybe thought about doing, but like, eh, or I don't know what it is. The Spirit does. But have you taken the time to stop and, and listen in the listening prayer and just say, Lord, where, where are you calling me? Where are you calling me? Because 
It's easy, it's easy in our Christian life, it's super easy for me to just focus on myself and my own faith and am I growing in my faith and all these different things. Um, but I think sometimes when we're so focused on ourselves and we're so like, we're in the boat, I think sometimes we, we miss it because it's when we, it's when we look out, we, we stop focusing maybe so much on ourselves and we start focusing on, like Casey said, the heart of the Father is to see lost people come to know him. And so as I start to look outside of the boat and, and start to see where is God calling me, it's in those times that I'm not like obsessing over myself as much that I'm probably the most healthy when I'm not focusing on myself and I'm focusing on the Holy Spirit being filled with him, responding to his calling. So I, I'd encourage you that if you haven't to take time and to get alone and to sit and to sit in silence, which is super weird for us in 2019, but to just listen to the Holy Spirit. To see, Lord, where are, you, where are you calling me? Give me a clear sense of calling so that I can step out of the boat towards you. And see, every conversation that we have doesn't result in somebody getting saved. It doesn't always go the way we thought. We don't always know the end game. Sometimes God's just teaching you something and you need to step out. But we're not, we're not responsible for the results, right? Because really the results that we're seeking, we can't even achieve on our own. We can't save people. We can't, we can't make people want to get baptized. We can't make people join the church. Jesus couldn't walk on water, but because, of, because he knew the one who was calling him, he was willing to take a step into something that seemed a little bit crazy at the time. So Jesus doesn't burden us with results. He just calls us to get out of the boat, to respond to where he's calling us. And we can expect, we can expect based on his character, based on who he is, based on what we read in scripture, that he will sustain us, that he will meet us in those times as we live into that expectation. So let's pray. Lord, thank you that you meet us. Thank you for your spirit. Lord, that you brought to us through your death and resurrection for our sin. Lord, I pray over the Avenue Church, I pray over Church United, God, that we would be a church who first is filled with the Holy Spirit. Lord, filled to the brim, that we would constantly run back to our source, which is your spirit. And then, Lord, that we would be willing in that filling to, to get out of the boat to what you've called us to, to step into the unknown, not trusting in ourselves, not trusting in our ability to see it come true, God, but trusting in the one who's calling us, trusting in you. Lord, we thank you we thank you, we thank you for your gospel, for who you are, that you call us and that you meet us in the calling. In Christ's name, amen. You guys are dismissed. Thank you so much for worshiping with us today. Um, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May his light shine upon you. Go in peace. We'll love to see you guys next week.